Okay, I think uh, time to start. So, good evening, all of you. Uh, I, on behalf of uh, the whole uh, committee of uh, Ex uh, Isaga Bangalore chapter, welcome you all. Uh, thanks for joining in big numbers. Uh, I'm sure I think it's the best time to have this online session now in this current situation. So, I hope all of you are safe and, in fact, healthy at home. And uh, so, a quick, uh, I'll just spend two minutes time and then I'll hand over to the speaker. Uh, I think you are joining. So once again, I welcome you all. Uh, I'm sure I think you already, a uh, few of you who are joining, uh, joined in the past, uh, you know the, the ground rules. In fact, uh, you all attendees are in uh, listen only mode. Uh, in fact, uh, of course, keep keep chat, putting a, uh, a chatting on the chat window and uh, and at the end or in between as the session progresses. Any questions to the speaker, you can put it in the Q&A box. Uh, I request all of you to put your questions in the uh, Q&A box. I'm sure all of you would have now navigated the interface. There is a Q&A box where you can put your questions, where we can track and uh, at the end we can put it back to the speaker and I'm sure all will be answered. So that's, uh, that's it. So welcome once again on behalf of uh, Isaka Bangalore chapter, myself Satish, uh, the current president of Isaga Bangalore chapter. Welcome you all for this, ex uh, in fact, a, a great session on auditing privacy protection through data protection by Navi. In fact, uh, of course, Mr. Vijay Shankar, who is fondly known as Navi. Now, I'll just take two minutes uh, before we jump in to the session or before I hand it over to the speaker. Uh, sure, rest all is uh, explained here. We are live on the Engage platform, I'm sure, uh, you, you have been st start, starting engaging this with the new platform. Uh, this is sim similar to the global platform. We are also, of course, live on Facebook, LinkedIn, and other channels. Uh, so we have been actively doing these sessions. Uh, in fact, uh, for the last uh, few, last month, we had one session in the chapter office and one online. Uh, I'm sure many of you would have joined on Zero Trust Security. That was a great session. In fact, uh, which was highly a uh, lot of participation and I can see today it's much more much more than the last session because of uh, of course even this session is very very in fact uh, active and current topic so and uh, going back to Isaka I, I think if you can just see isaka.org there's uh, there's something very interesting on the COVID-19 you can just go through uh, the COVID-19 uh, there are a few white papers blogs and uh, around this talk uh, of course because today everyone is looking for certain resources on this specifically. So there are a lot of good resources on the isaka.org site specifically around this. Like probably you can uh, read some papers on business continuity management, uh, on pandemic planning and many other very relevant to currently what we are going through. Uh, that's a very uh, active in fact uh, page. Uh, and of course we can keep looking uh, for more to come. And uh, with that, I think uh, I should now, uh, and rest, I'm sure many of your members, if uh, non-members, uh, you can just take membership to get more value. Uh, at the chapter, we keep conducting these review classes. As we speak, the CISA and series classes are going on. In fact, tomorrow, the CISA is, we have moved to online through Zoom, so that to last two sessions were at the classroom, but uh, tomorrow, considering the current situation, we have moved to online. And 4th April, we're starting season. Probably you can encourage your friends, colleagues, peers to uh, join and take the benefit of these review classes, which are basically delivered by industry professionals. So with that, uh, uh, I'll just introduce the speaker and then I'll hand it over to him uh, so that, uh, so I'm sure many of you, uh, I think uh, mostly Navi does not need any introduction, but still, the People who do not know Navi, uh, in fact, uh, is very uh, fondly called as Navi. In fact, uh, he's the, I, I can say, very passionate and, of course, in this industry and in this domain, uh, especially. So, he has been pioneered in the field of cyber law. I'm sure uh, or many of you know since IT Act, uh, in fact, very early stages of IT Act, he started working in this domain. And uh, he keeps writing. Uh, very vocal. In fact, uh, you should visit navi.org, his blogs, very interesting articles. He's also the founder of uh, navi.org and the Cyber Law College and uh, is visiting faculty for many other institutions. Of course, he, he loves sharing his thoughts and uh, his whole 
and but knowledge to many i, I keep uh, requesting him for many and he never says no he is also the author of the book uh, personal data protection act of india pdpa 20 with the motto be aware be ready and be compliant yes. uh, very interesting book navi is also the founder of uh, chairman of foundation of data protection professionals in india in fact uh, which is dedicated to the development of knowledgeable efficient and ethical data protection ecosystem in india you can visit fdppi.in and is also the architect of uh, personal data protection standard of india as a framework for indian companies to be compliant with data protection laws which includes a sensitive model for data trust score envisaged in indian laws navi is also well known netizen activist uh, activist and is available through email at navi9@gmail.com so with that introduction now i will just stop sharing my screen and then uh, navi you can now share your screen so thanks navi for accepting our request and welcome once again for the great session i'm sure we'll have a great session so also before i uh, give it to him a quick uh, poll normally uh, i don't know if i stop sharing will, it, will you see my poll or not i think you should uh, let me So now we know you can share your screen. I can uh, share my screen, but the poll you you uh, display the poll. I yes, don't. Yes, don't worry. I I I will I will definitely I'm I'll be throughout uh, the session. Uh, so uh, poll first, is just uh, yeah. You can uh, just throw it open. Let us have the reactions. Then I will start. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks, thanks, Navi. So the first poll is live. It's just just a it's just icebreaker just to start with. Uh, uh, anyway, we'll just give. Two more, three more seconds. I can see uh, around fifty percent voting already done. Uh, let's give a few more seconds. Just a very basic uh, question to start with to just understand the audience. Yeah, the poll is live, and uh, I'll st I'll stop the polling so that we can see the results in. We'll just give one more second, two more seconds. Around seventy-five percent voted, requesting all to participate actively. Uh, just a lighter note: uh, CPs will be provided only to the participants who are live, active. Uh, Zoom provides a very interesting uh, attentive score, uh, just just for the benefit of all. So, people who are attentive will get CPs. Just a lighter side, but uh, anyway. So the poll is now. I think mostly uh, people have. a uh, poll so let me end the polling uh, and i'm sure all of you can see the uh, poll poll results uh, just a quick note uh, the poll results are displayed on a screen and uh, you can you close your because once the session starts still this window may be open you can close it uh, so i think some, around uh, 33% yes and uh, 48 people consider no And of course, nineteen people say not sure. Uh, Navi, I think you can also see the poll results. Yeah, yeah, I can see. I can see. Excellent, yeah. excellent. So, so with that uh, now I will stop. Stop my. Sh Now, second, second poll also you can uh, release. So let's uh, see the. Yeah, excellent. Second poll. Yeah, yeah, true, true. Yes, true, very true. I forgot that so the two polls. Yes. So let me close this and let me go to the second poll. yeah the second poll is live uh, for you to start voting great a uh, lot of active participation see it's very interesting to see uh, around 270 participants live uh, i'm very happy to see a very active participation today in fact of course last time we had around 250 people live and today we already have 270 people live in this webinar uh, very active participation thank you all for joining once again now okay i think uh, 85% voted rest are still probably thinking one more second and yes let me end the poll and let me share the results So 53% says yes, 17% no, and 29% not sure. Anyway, after the session, probably now we'll enlighten us. And let me stop sharing the results. And I think 
Yeah, you can share my screen. Yes, now you can share your screen now and you can take it forward. But still, I am. I can still uh, when in the right place when you want the other polls. Uh, I can still continue. Yes, we can see your screen and your voice is clear. Uh, a okay. quick question from all of you. So all of you can see Navi's screen and uh, of course his voice is clear. Now you can just talk. Yeah. Yeah. Good evening, friends. Uh, I'm happy to see a large gathering for this Isaka webinar. Uh, the fact is that this subject is of great interest to everybody. And um, obviously, the members of ISACA should be as much interested as any other group of people in uh, information security or even uh, law. So I have tried to give the title to this particular uh, uh, talk more relevant to the uh, auditors because uh, that word auditing is always very exciting for many of us. So auditing privacy protection through data protection. So that is the topic which we will be discussing during the uh, discussion. Of course, we will be uh, covering uh, the Personal Data Protection uh, Act, um, the background under which this act is coming into being, and then uh, the role of an auditor and uh, the challenges and probably some time to discuss likely solutions. This is generally the agenda I have kept. Now we had these uh, two polls. Uh, one was about the Information Technology Act, which is relevant for the background. And the second was for uh, the general perception which is there in the market about uh, the impact of this particular legislation, uh, particularly uh, with reference to how will the government be able to use or misuse the uh, provisions of the act for uh, creating a surveillance uh, state if it is so. So we have had your perceptions, uh, which I will try to elaborate as we go along. So for the background, we have seen 48% of uh, the participants have uh, not felt that the Information Technology Act uh, has uh, any provisions on data protection. But I am happy to see that at least 33% of the people have said that um, Information Technology Act has something in it which we may call as data protection. Of course, as most of you are aware, this Information Technology Act came in 2000 basically for promoting e-commerce. It was only in 2008 that through an amendment, uh, the provisions related to data protection were added and that became effective from 2009. Um, however, one of the major rules regarding the Section 43 capital A and Section 79 they came only in 2011. So from 2011, the Information Technology Act has several, um, I mean, provisions which are directly related to what we call as data protection uh, today. In fact, this continuity from the Information Technology Act to this Personal Data Protection Act, it is important for us to recognize because in the new act, one of the provisions is that section 43 capital A of Information Technology Act will be uh, removed because the provisions of that section, one section, is now being replaced by this entire new act. This itself shows that what we are going to see as in uh, Personal Data Protection Act, which we may call as PDPA, is actually a continuation of Information Technology Act. Information Technology Act had the provisions of data protection but maybe it was not adequate. There was this 43A which said reasonable security practice for sensitive personal information. There was section 43 itself which tried to cover the data breach uh, which causes any uh, damage to any person. However, the kind of regulatory mechanism required to implement the provisions were not effective in Information Technology Act because that was a yes, cyber crime legislation. What we mean by cyber crime legislation is the provisions of the act could be invoked only when there is somebody who has become a victim of a certain incident, which we may call as cyber crime. 
So only when there is a cause of action for a victim, he is able to file a complaint either with the adjudicator for civil claims or with the police for any criminal um, accusation. Then only the Information Technology Act becomes effective. Therefore, the implementation had to wait until uh, the uh, by victim goes to a particular adjudicator or the uh, police and produce some prima facie evidence. And that was a little difficult. So that's why we have today a situation where there are so many cyber crimes which are happening around us, but there are very few uh, judgments either in of civil nature or for criminal nature. But this act of Personal Data Protection Act, how it differs from the earlier act is that this is a compliance related act in the sense that the main provisions of this act is a guidance to the industry and other stakeholders to do something or not to do something. And the provisions of penalty will apply when that particular compliance uh, aspect is not fulfilled. There is no need for us to wait for somebody to suffer a loss for invoking the penalty provisions of PDPA. So therefore, we will be seeing a lot more I mean, uh, penalties being imposed. And of course, unlike the ITA 2000, where the adjudicator was supposed to be the person who had to regulate, here you have got a full-fledged data protection authority, which will uh, definitely have much better supervision. Because of these two differences, the Personal Data Protection Act, which is a continuation of Information Technology Act, is expected to be much more effective than the previous act for the purpose of data protection. So though we can say ITA 2000 had data protection, we are going to have something better than that. Now the current status of this particular act is that when the first discussion about this came up, which was during the Aadhaar discussions in the Supreme Court, there was a debate that uh, in India, privacy right, right to privacy of a citizen was not guaranteed under the constitution. When this point was raised, the Supreme Court immediately called for a bench of nine uh, uh, judges and then came up with a judgment in which they said that the right to privacy is a fundamental right in India. This was in 2017. Immediately yeah. after that, we had this uh, Justice Sri Krishna Committee, which came up with its recommendation after studying the international situation of various laws. Ultimately, in December 2018, we had the first version of PDPA called PDPA 2018, which was released for public comments. But before the public comments could be uh, completely uh, received and uh, analyzed, we had uh, the elections and therefore uh, the bill PDPA 2018 lapsed. And again, this PDPA 2019 was introduced in December 2019. And that is a bill which is likely to become an act in this current year. Now we expect that when it is passed, it may be called as PDPA 2020. Hopefully this Corona problems will uh, end very soon. Therefore, uh, the parliament will function. And um, in fact, it was expected that uh, in April, this uh, act could be taken up by the parliament for passage. But right now, the bill is in the hands of a joint parliamentary committee. And maybe by about June, we expect the law uh, to be uh, perhaps passed by the uh, two houses of the parliament. Of course, for the entire provisions of the law to come into effect, there has to be this DPA, that is the Data Protection Authority, which will take about three months from the date the act is passed. And subsequent to that, the DPA himself will have to sit and write for a lot of regulations, starting with who has to register with him, and if he registers, what are the provisions, uh, documents he has to give, etc., etc. By the time the DPA is likely to impose penalties and other things, there will be Elapse of another six months, I suppose. So we are really talking of a one-year time span in which this act will become fully uh, operative. But 
I have been insisting everywhere that Navi, Navi a small request. You can just go full screen, please. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I, I will do that. One, just one minute. Yeah. Uh, is it okay now? Yes, yes, it's perfectly fine. Thanks. Oh, this will be too much. Okay. No, it, okay. no, no. Yeah, this, this is fine. This should be okay. This is fine. Yes. Okay. Thanks. So, um, this particular legislation, which is likely to be passed during this year, would perhaps be the first of such uh, legislations which will come to uh, come in India. And we are all aware of the GDPR and um, GDPR took about uh, two years um, for it to be fully implemented and uh, hopefully this particular legislation will be implemented in about an year's time. But implementation of a privacy compliance program in any organization normally is a big journey. It is not overnight. It will take a lot of time. Our own experience when we uh, try to provide consultancy to companies is that anywhere between three to six months, they, uh, even the basic things will not start happening in an organization. Therefore, this entire one year, even if it is available, it is required for companies to prepare themselves. And um, since India has a tradition of passing a law and saying that the law is effective from today, I expect that the companies will start preparing from now onwards for the law which is likely to come next year. Even if uh, some people argue that there is going to be some changes in the law itself, the possibilities of changes are very few and uh, we know the direction and uh, any minor changes we can always handle. That is why we are trying to study this law on the basis of the personal data protection bill which is presently uh, in the parliament. Now, just to look at this PDPA, there are a lot of several different types of stakeholders who are looking at this PDPA. Starting from the privacy activists who are in the forefront of uh, this legislation coming into um, uh, uh, the current status, we have the data processing entities, the citizens, auditors, DPOs, um, and the other information security professionals. Just to understand that each of these stakeholders may have a different perspective, we need to look at the fact that citizens look at PDPA as a law which will provide protection for their privacy, whatever privacy means. In fact, privacy is actually considered to be a provision related to the human rights and to protect that human rights citizens are looking at PDPA as a means. Now the privacy activists are looking at PDPA as basically the means of protecting the right to privacy and they are the persons who are today most vocal about government trying to use this legislation for surveillance. They are also complaining that the industries are using this uh, law for, uh, in a way, making uh, inappropriate use of the personal data. So privacy activists uh, criticize both the uh, companies and organizations who use data and they uh, call data as a fundamental raw material like uh, oil. They want to make money out of that. Big data, this, uh, the entire uh, IoT industry, they, it all depends on this privacy, but these privacy activists feel that there is an exploitation of personal data. And at the same time, they are also unhappy that the government has got too many uh, powers. Compared to this, we have these data processing entities, which are all the companies, most of us uh, deal with these companies. And uh, they are uh, at the receiving end of this law because the entire compliance structure is directed towards these data processing entities. And if they are not properly compliant, they are the persons who will have to face the brunt of penalties. Now, as far as the professionals are concerned, today we have got the IT professionals and the information security professionals who are already working within the corporate environment. They are looking at PDPA because 
they feel that PDPA may give them an opportunity to perhaps reorient their career and um, from IT and IS, they can become privacy professionals. Now, in the act, it is specifically provided that there will be a category of people who will pursue a profession called data protection officers and they will be the privacy professionals who will be actually the in the forefront of uh, implementing the PDPA. And um, according to whatever is uh, expected, these DPOs will perhaps be responsible to the entire implementation of PDPA in an organization. And they are likely to be not only on par with the CISOs or the CTOs, but perhaps a bit ahead of CISOs and CTOs uh, in terms of their importance to the organization and they will be reporting perhaps directly to the CEOs. There are certain organizations which have redesignated their CISOs as DPOs, but going forward, it is unlikely that CISOs will automatically become DPOs because there will be a conflict of interest. DPOs will emerge as an independent profession and uh, they are likely to be um, perhaps working in the organization almost on par with the established profession of CISOs. Now on the other end, we have got these auditors. The auditors have an important role in PDPA because they are the persons who are being the eyes and ears of the Data Protection Authority and they will be looking at the compliance requirements of the various organizations and their reports will be considered very vital for the compliance. This is how PDPA, a single act, has got these multiple stakeholders and each will have their own perspectives. In fact, the preamble of the particular law recognizes at least three stakeholders, which is the citizens who want their right to privacy being uh, uh, protected, the industry which has to process the data and make uh, use of that for their business, and thirdly, the government which has to use the data again for law enforcement and security of the state. All these three categories have been recognized in the preamble and the whole act, the government has recognized that it has to balance the requirements of these three stakeholders. Now, with this background, if you look at this particular act, one of the things which we in the IT industry have to remember is that the principal objective of PDPA is to protect the right to privacy of an individual. In fact, data protection is only incidental. That's why we say that this is a personal data protection uh, act. In fact, data protection act is the one which protects all kinds of data, which is personal data as well as non-personal data. A co company will have a lot of non-personal data, which is highly valuable and that is protected by Information Technology Act itself because any unauthorized access to the data which reduces the value of the data automatically becomes an offense under Information Technology Act. Even the ISMS systems like your 27001, they are all aimed towards protecting data in general. What this act does is it tries to focus more on one category of data, which is the personal data, and says that this personal data has to be protected in a particular manner, failing which certain uh, penalties will be uh, levied. So, this is important for us to recognize that under PDPA, data protection is an incidental objective. It is only a means to protect the privacy. In a way, data protection is necessary, but not sufficient. What is required is to protect the privacy of individuals. Who are the individuals? We are not talking of the privacy of the corporate entity. We are talking of the privacy of individuals who, for various reasons, share their personal data with the corporate uh, entity. So that is the important thing which we have to recognize. And that is why we often have a clash between privacy activists and the companies. Now, if the purpose of Data Protection Act, this Personal Data Protection Act is to protect privacy, then the next question which we have to look at is, what is privacy? What is the right to privacy? 
unfortunately this right to privacy has not been unambiguously defined even in this famous puttaswami judgment by the nine um, uh, members of uh, the supreme court which delivered the particular uh, uh, judgment uh, which is called puttaswami uh, judgment okay now one of the aspects of privacy which was recognized earlier was something which we used to refer as spatial privacy that is mr navi i'm sorry to come back i think your screen is some issue i think you have to put it to full screen some part of the screen is getting trunc truncated uh -huh. you put it in the presentation mode please means uh, maybe we can go to view is, is this okay uh, this is fine but i think uh, is there a, can you go to view and uh, no no if i put it as full screen uh -huh. um, this is what uh, is coming uh, no 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 uh, it's getting truncated okay then this is better this, okay. this is fine okay. uh, I, i think there is something uh, uh, i think you can you need to go to that uh, slide show mode i believe mm, no can you go to view and slide show mode one minute uh, maybe view view uh, 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 sorry in, in the menu there is a slide show in the menu Okay. Uh, slide, uh, uh, here, slide show, slide show. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Now this is perf perfectly fine. But you went to the first slide. Maybe, maybe all can confirm. Is it fine, all of you? But still, I think some part of the screen is getting truncated. Is this okay, or should I go back to that uh, partial screen? Uh, this is still. I think some part of the screen is getting truncated. Uh, that may be because of resolution of some uh, this thing. I don't know. Okay, maybe I think the previous mode was uh, fine. I believe this should be fine. This fine. You can go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so privacy. One aspect of privacy we were discussing was called spatial privacy, which was the kind of feeling which we have uh, where uh, we don't want people to come too near us, kind of a thing. and this was highlighted in some of the judgments of the supreme court one of which was correct singh uh, judgment in which the court said that every person has got a right not to be disturbed at home in the night even by the law enforcement people so this was the kind of privacy which we in india were accustomed to what rutha swami judgment did was it expanded this particular right to what is called a fundamental right under article 21 and said right to privacy is part of right to live with dignity and personal uh, liberty and to implement this responsibility the government was required to pass a law and therefore this pdpa was uh, actually drafted so in a way this pdpa is being introduced by the government because supreme court wants this kind of a law to protect the privacy of an individual today we are criticizing this pdpa provisions to such an extent as if government is trying to bring this law to improve its own surveillance in fact given an option government would not like to have any privacy law at all they are quite happy with what is there today they are doing their surveillance there is no accountability and they will be happy to do that it is only because the supreme court feels that right to privacy has to be protected through a law government has come up with the law and therefore if this law gets delayed the damage is not to the government but only to the ordinary citizens of the country who are aspiring for this uh, pr protection okay so even passing this judgment supreme court said that we don't know how to define privacy but perhaps the nearest we can come to uh, defining privacy is the right to be left alone okay the right to privacy is right of an individual to be left alone this is like an implied uh, definition which they have given but when you take this as a definition one peculiar thing is that a right to be left alone is not something which can be measured in terms of physical uh, distances like now we are talking of uh, the social distancing 1 meter distance or something like that that is not the <clears throat> the right to privacy because what is important is that a person should feel it is like a state of mind in which he feels that he is free in which 
uh, in certain circumstances, even if people are around you, you may feel free. In certain circumstances, if, even if people are not around you, you feel uncomfortable. So this state of mind is what the government of India is trying to protect. And another problem the Supreme Court created was that this state of mind is of individuals and different individuals at different points of time will have different preferences. But the government and the Supreme Court feels that we have to find a way of knowing what is the choice of an individual at a particular point of time and then try to protect that choice. The choice is for what part of my information I have to share with the public. Since Today, we all live in digital world. Privacy protection is not possible without protecting the information which is in the form of data. And which data has to be protected for giving this freedom uh, of uh, uh, the person or to give a feeling of uh, uh, being uh, free, that only the person has to tell. The person has to tell, this is my personal information and I should have the choice of sharing it with somebody. And that is the only way privacy is being protected. Now the industry people can think and uh, appreciate how complicated it is to write a law which is applicable to all the citizens of the country and to say that whatever goes on in your mind as your choice for sharing personal information, we will try to protect it by law. It is almost impossible, but still that is how the laws everywhere in the world are trying to proceed and that is why we bank upon what is called the consent. We ask an individual, what is your preference? What kind of information you want to share? And then we try to make it as a decision rule and try to protect it. But the difficulty is a person will give one in one choice yesterday and today his choice may be different. And uh, you have to also give him an option to withdraw his consent and so on. So this particular legislation tries to provide that freedom of choice to the person and the freedom of choice is what kind of personal information he has to share with the data processor and instruct the data processor how he should process the data and that is how the right to privacy gets linked to the data protection which is an IT activity. So that is why I use, try to use the term that we are trying to protect privacy through data protection or in other words, our data protection is for the purpose of privacy protection. So the IT industry people should remember that all this data protection activity they are undergoing is not only to protect data as an inanimate object, but to actually protect the privacy of the person who is behind that data. So whenever we consider what risk is there, for a particular process, whether there is a privacy risk, that privacy risk is not a risk associated with only the processing of the data. It is a risk associated with what kind of harm can be caused to the person whose personal data is being processed. This is the difference between pure data protection and the privacy protection. Now, for determining which kind of information is to be protected, we must know that there is one set of information which a data subject knows about himself and there is also something which he does not know. Out of this information which he knows, certain things he considers as confidential which he doesn't want to share. Certain things are already public that there is no point in sharing. There is only one set of information that the data subject is aware about himself, like his name, his email address, his telephone number, which he can share on certain conditional basis. So this is one part of the data protection objective or the objective of this law. On the other hand, there are a lot of information which is data subject doesn't know. And the question of him giving a choice or giving a consent does not arise. Out of this category of information, one is the data, personal data which is stolen by criminals who do not take any instructions from anybody, any consent from anybody. The other part is the government which collects some information for surveillance purpose. And third, the industry collects some information and tries to build what we call as a profile of a person. 
profiling of a person is actually an opinion which the organization develops and sometimes it, even though the raw material for that opinion is whatever has been conditionally shared, the opinion itself is entirely the uh, work of the organization and uh, all this artificial intelligence, algorithms and other things try, try to actually make the best guess of what the particular information means in terms of what this data subject is likely to do tomorrow. That profiling is something which the companies create and many times the data subject doesn't know what is this profile. We do not know what is the profile which a credit company is having about me, whether they will give me 5 lakhs loans or 2 lakhs loans. That is something which the company may know. And this uh, PDPS tries to link this profiling to the data which the individual himself is aware and shares with the company together as a data to be protected. The PDPA also provides certain restrictions on the surveillance. So all these three aspects of data, information with the subject knows and shares, information which the government collects by surveillance, information which is profiled by the company, these three categories of personal data come under the ambit of this PDPA. This is stolen by criminal, criminals, that data goes into the Information Technology Act. So with this, the law prescribes one certain data protection principles which the data processor has to follow. It prescribes certain obligations for the protection to be complied with. It talks about penalties and punishments. It creates an authority called data protection uh, authority. It designates a person within the organization to hold the responsibility called the DPO. In addition, for various reasons, it provides certain exemptions in certain cases to government agencies from all provisions. This is the one which is being debated a lot in the recent days as if the government is creating an Orwellian state or something like that. The second aspect is it provides exemptions not from all provisions of PDPA but only to the provision that consent is required before a data is processed. Only for that consent certain exemptions are there. In addition to that certain specific situations like medical emergency and other things are also part of the exemption. So certain prescriptions and certain exemptions, they go together in this particular law. Additionally, the law has to define what is a personal data, which includes profiling. It classifies data into personal, sensitive personal, depending upon the likely impact on the individual if the data is not handled properly. It also classifies the data handlers as data fiduciaries and data processors, two main categories. And within the data fiduciary, it also classifies them as significant data fiduciary, guardian data fiduciary, or another category called a consent manager, three kinds of data fiduciaries. It introduces an instrument by which a consent may be given by the data owner to the data handler, who is the data fiduciary, to instruct how the data or the information, personal data should be handled by the data fiduciary. This is what the law tries to uh, achieve. But we must remember that Personal Data Protection Act may basic objective is to protect the right to privacy. But right to privacy itself is not an absolute right, though it is a fundamental right. Like every other fundamental right, right to privacy is subject to the powers of the government to impose reasonable restrictions. This was reiterated not only in the Potaswami judgment, but also in a subsequent 2019 judgment of the Supreme Court called Ritesh Sinha versus government of UP. And what are the reasonable restrictions? Some indications are available under, again, the Constitution itself under Article 19.2. These reasonable restrictions include these seven items. One is law can impose reasonable restrictions in the interest of the sovereignty and integrity of India, the security of the state, friendly relations with the foreign states, public order, all this 
exemptions can be provided. This is as per the constitution. Okay. Additionally, the constitution provides that law can impose reasonable restrictions also for reasons such as decency or morality in relation to contempt of court, in relation to defamation or incitement to an offense. These, out of this, this last four items, the government has actually not considered for taking an exemption for itself. Whatever has been retained as the power of the government to impose reasonable restrictions on the right to privacy is restricted to the first four items and not this last four items. Despite this, people are complaining that this act has got certain enormous powers to the government and there is Orwellian state, all this, that is all not fully supported by the way the law has been uh, drafted. Now, if you just look at PDP, <clears throat> okay, this contains about 14 chapters, out of which one set is definitions and applicability. There are exemptions, exemptions from consent. There are certain rights given to the data principle. We call the, the data subject under this law as data principle. The data controller, as called in the GDPR, we call him as the data fiduciary. So therefore, we have the data principle and data fiduciary in replacement of data subject and the data controller. And certain rights are given to this data principle. So these are one set. Second set is, what are the obligations of the data fiduciary? What are the transparency and accountability measures? What are the restrictions on the transfer of data outside India? How children's data has to be handled? This is another set of um, things which are covered in PDPA under these different chapters. There are also a chapter on penalties and offenses. There is a chapter on data protection authority, chapter on appellate tribunal, and two chapters which are of miscellaneous nature, how the funding of this DPA will be um, organized, and certain other miscellaneous uh, provisions. This is the structure of the PDPA. There is a resemblance to GDPR to the extent that there are principles, there are uh, rights, there are uh, the transparency and accountability measures, cross-border restrictions. These are all there in GDPR also. The same thing is available here also. But there are certain subtle differences, some of which we will try to see sometimes later. Okay. Are there any questions which I would you would like to answer at this point of time? Satish, any questions? Uh, yeah, there are a lot of questions in the Q&A window, but maybe uh, I think we can take it at the end. Uh, okay. Okay. If you want, we can take a couple of questions now. Yeah, yeah that, that's fine. Uh, maybe I think then uh, let me read out the questions for yeah. you. So, uh, uh, Mr. Vikram asks, when, when will the, will be, the data protection bill will be passed? We are expecting that it will be presented back in the next session. Um, and uh, hopefully, before the end of June, the act will be passed. Uh, that is my expectation. Okay, subject to all these uncertainties which we are presently going through. For any reason, if the current session is completely uh, postponed or something like that, it may get delayed. Otherwise, by June, uh, the law should be passed. By September, the DPA should be in place. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, Mr. Rajesh asks, uh, what will be the impact on auditing process if personal data protection bill is passed in I'm India? I'm going to take it up in the next section. Yeah, yeah, correct. Okay. That's what so I do, that yeah. you're going to cover. Yeah. Uh, how does the Data Protection Act try to protect data? It tries to protect the privacy. <clears throat> Please remember this. Data Protection Act protects privacy of the individual. I told you protection of data is incidental. That's why it says that if you want to protect the privacy of an individual, there is something called a personal data and the organization which has got the control of that personal data has to put in its own efforts in securing it so that the privacy is protected. So if you want to use ISO standard, if you want to you develop your own framework, 
PDPA does not prescribe, like in the case of HIPAA or something like that, a security rule. It, it says that I expect the data of fiduciary to protect the privacy of the individual by protecting the data, personal data. How to do it? You try to find out. If your effort is not good enough, I will impose a penalty, particularly when there is a breach. Even if there is no breach, if the data protection authority feels that the efforts taken are in inadequate, penalties can be imposed. Okay. So please remember, objective is to protect the privacy and protecting data is incidental. We'll come back to this a little later. Keep this thought in your uh, mind. Yeah, next question. Uh, Mr. Karuna is asking, is PDPA going to be an amendment to IT Act? or an no, it's, a, it's an independent act. There will be an amendment to IT Act, which is deletion of Section 43, capital A. Okay, thank you. But people like us are telling that there is a link between ITA 2000 and this. ITA 2043A spoke about reasonable security practice and due diligence. And that is getting expanded in this PDPA. And that is why even as of today, when ITA 2000 is effective, PDPA is still not effective. It is only in a draft stage. This draft PDPA becomes the due diligence under ITA 2000. This is my uh, view. And that's why I want industries to actually start implementing this portion of PDPA as part of the due diligence. And when it becomes an act, it becomes a completely uh, revised uh, implementation. Okay. Now, shall we go ahead and then come back to questions later? Yes, yes. That's so, fine. You can continue. Thanks. So now we'll come to the role of an auditor. Okay. Now, PDPA envisages roles for two kinds of auditors. One is the internal auditor and the other is the external auditor. The internal auditor is the data protection officer. When we say audit, we are talking of checking against certain standards. Okay. So the DPO is the person who is responsible for the compliance within an organization. And for that purpose, he has to keep on monitoring the um, activities of data processing which happens within his company. I'm talking of personal data processing within his company. Therefore, he is a concurrent auditor for an organization. And in fact, by the time the registration is required, registration of data fiduciaries is mandatory for significant data fiduciaries. See, when we use the term significant data fiduciaries, we must remember that the PDPA provides a discretion to the data protection authority to prescribe the criteria by which a data fiduciary can be designated as a significant data fiduciary. All companies which are handling sensitive personal data need not be designated as significant data fiduciary. And all the companies which are handling only personal data which is non-sensitive can escape the distinction uh, uh, designation of a significant data uh, fiduciary if their volume of processing is large. So the discretion lies with the DPA to say this particular company is a significant data fiduciary or this class of companies and this is not. Okay. So such companies need to register themselves as soon as the uh, provisions for the registration is mentioned. At the time of registration, every such company has to submit a document called privacy by design policy. This is something like a prospectus which a company files with the SEBI before seeking funds from the public kind of a thing. So before you are authorized to process personal data, you have to submit a plan of action to the data protection authority of why you are collecting a certain personal data, how you are collecting it, how you are processing it, how you are trying to protect this personal data as per the different provisions of information, uh, the PDPA. All this should be part of a policy document called privacy by design policy. See, this is slightly different from the GDPR provision, which says one of the requirements is, or, 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 of accountability is privacy should be protected by design. What it means is that in the design of the business 
structure of the organization, starting from the way you collect, you market your uh, customers to the how you process. In that uh, architecture of data processing, you should ensure privacy is protected. That is the interpretation we use for privacy by design in GDPR. Here we are talking of a policy document. Okay. Now, in, this is to me more like a declaration of intent of a data fiduciary put down in writing, and this policy document is submitted to the DPA and it is certified by the DPA. Okay. So I look at it more like this prospectus for a public issue kind of a uh, thing. This is now uh, has to be prepared by somebody in the organization, but it has to be reviewed and approved by the data protection officer, DPO. Probably some companies will ask the DPO himself to prepare it, but anyway, he will be the person who has to approve that and then take it to the DPA for certification. The other aspect of internal data processing, I mean, auditing is, there is something called data protection impact assessment. Whenever a new technology is used, new processing is being done, then the company will have to prepare a DPIA kind of a uh, report, which again has to be certified by the uh, particular uh, DPO and again taken to the um, uh, DPA for approval. Thirdly, periodically the DPO may have to do internal audits, um, maybe once in a half year, once in a quarter, and for some reasons which I will state that um, if your company is providing quarterly reports to the stock exchange with every quarterly report, there should be a sort of a uh, audit report by the internal DPO. The external auditor will come in because the act specifies that it is mandatory for the significant data fiduciaries to conduct an external audit on an annual basis, which means that like statutory financial audit, statutory data audit becomes a mandatory requirement of significant data fiduciaries. And this has to be done by an external auditor, not the DPO. What the DPO does during the year, perhaps we'll have to supplement the work of this particular uh, annual auditor. Additionally, whenever required, DPA can designate a particular external data auditor for some kind of an audit, which is like an inspection when complaints are received or something like that, they may actually ask the um, uh, external data auditor to audit a particular uh, company from the perspective of data audit. Okay, so this is the role of an external auditor. Now, this uh, purpose of this data audit is one, to check and report the compliance of different measures as required under PDPA and reduce it to some kind of a certification, audit certificates. And in the case of at least the DPO particularly, and of course external auditors also if possible, guide the stakeholders on what, where they are making the mistakes and how they should perhaps comply with the law. On the other hand, these auditors will have to assist the data protection authority in the discharge of its responsibilities whenever it seeks that uh, cooperation. Additionally, there will be something called an adjudicator who is an authority which works under the uh, DPA and tries to adjudicate on the amount of penalty which has to be levied for any contravention. And the auditor may have to assist the adjudicator to arrive at what is a reasonable uh, penalty. So the different kinds of audits to summarize, we have the mandatory annual audit, data protection impact assessment audit. There are also mention of something called a harm audit, which is at various points of time, particularly under DPAA and other things, you have to make an assessment of what is the extent of harm caused to data principles. And whenever data breach happens, there has to be an audit of how the data breach happened and what was the impact of it in terms of how much of harm was uh, caused because of the data breach. In addition to this, there is a business associate audit that is whenever you engage services of a subcontractor, 
you have to retain the power to audit his facilities equivalent to whatever audit you undergo yourself. Then there is some provision for exemptions to be given to BPOs who process the, the personal data of foreigners, not Indian citizens, foreigners, but processing happens in India under a contract. Such companies can get an exemption uh, under this particular act through a notification. But if something like that has to happen, an application has to be made to the DPA for which I feel there is an audit requirement, a certification that this particular division does this particular activity and we seek your exemption. Similarly, there is another exemption which the law provides, which is called sandbox uh, exemption that is uh, applicable perhaps to startup companies and to companies which are trying to test certain new technologies for whom if they feel that this PDPA could be a hindrance at the testing stage, the provision is that they can apply to the DPA and say that they want to create a sandbox and uh, process the personal data within a controlled environment and that they should be exempted from the other provisions of PDPA. And such exemptions can be given for a total period of three years, one year to be extended uh, on subsequent applications. So when such a thing is required, that entire project also has to be audited. So I look at it as a sandbox eligibility audit. These are in addition to the internal periodical data audit by the DPO. So you can see that PDPA will introduce five, six different types of data audits. We have to be familiar with the requirements of this. Now, one of the requirements which the auditors should appreciate is that data audit is different from other kinds of audit. Obviously, uh, it is different from the financial and other audits, but even if you come to the uh, audits which you are familiar with, like uh, information security audits, this data audit will be different. Um, and uh, though there are the international norms for personal data audit itself, BS 10,012 and then ISO 27701, I feel that audit under PDPA could be even uh, slightly different. And definitely it will be different from the normal ISMS frameworks of uh, 27001, COVID and other uh, uh, things. So in order to have, a, uh, to, to equip oneself to be a good auditor for PDPA, understanding of PDPA is a, extremely important for auditors and they have to distinguish PDPA from other international data protection laws, including GDPR, to avoid any misinterpretations. So with this, we will now go into certain uh, specific provisions, uh, which we can call as the essence of PDPA. <clears throat> uh, shall we uh, take any more questions here, Satish, to break the monotony? Yes, yes. In fact, there, there are too many questions, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we can definitely take a few, few questions. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Varun is asking, could you give examples of data processing entities that will come under the scope of this law? Okay. Data processing entities can be a company, can be a government organization, can be an educational institution, can be an association of persons. It can even be an individual who processes the personal data for commercial purposes. So partnership firms, proprietary concerns, irrespective of the constitution, everybody is a data entity, including the government. Okay, whether the government is Indian government or foreign government, both are coming under uh, this. As long as personal data, that is data which identifies a living individual, this word living I have added because that is their general understanding, not, very much, not exactly specified. So data which identifies a living individual is called personal data. Profiling is also personal data. And any company which processes such data, collects, stores, processes such data and transmits such data, they are all entities which come under the particular act. Okay? So yeah. Education institutions, bodies like ISACA, there is no exemption. The exemption is for small entities. 
there will be some exemption based on turnover. Exemption is for personal domestic purpose uh, data. The other exemption is for BPOs. Then periodical exemption is given to the startups under the sandbox scheme. Government agencies have got a different setup. I will uh, uh, discuss that separately. So other than that, every other organization which handles personal uh, data as of today come under the provisions of this act and uh, there is no exemption okay yeah thanks <clears throat> mr vijay is asking when personal information is given to third party vendor how to ensure that he has deleted the data in the case data principal has requested the ordination for deletion say as in gdpr here also the responsibility to ensure deletion when it becomes necessary lies with the data fiduciary so data fiduciary by contract has to make that mandatory to the subcontractor and should retain the provisions of conducting an audit of the processes of the data processor to ensure that he has got necessary means to delete the data in the sense that just as you have a privacy by design policy for the data fiduciary, you must ask your processor to develop a data I mean, uh, privacy by design policy and submit it to you. In effect, you will be the data protection authority for the subcontractor. Other than this, if anything goes wrong, you will be responsible as the person who directly took the obligation from the data uh, principle. Between you and the data processor, it's a contractual agreement. Between you and the data uh, principle, it is the statutory obligation. Remember, the word data fiduciary entitles data fiduciary to have a trustee kind of relationship. That is, you cannot say that all the thing I have to do is based on the consent. Consent is one of the instruments by which the data principles tells you how his data has to be processed. But beyond that, as a trustee, you should know how to process the data properly. And therefore, when you hand over the data to a subcontractor for whatever reasons, then it is your responsibility to ensure that all the provisions of this act is uh, fulfilled even when data is no longer in your hands, it is with somebody else. If one of the rights given to the data principle is deletion of data after a particular purpose is over, or when the consent is withdrawn, etc., you have to ensure that this provision also is carried out through your subcontractors. There is no escape from this. Okay? Okay, thanks. Uh, Mr. Arman is asking, uh, when go government monitors social media and identifies an individual, is this the viol violation of right of right to privacy? Say government monitors the activities for the purpose of identifying a law enforcement requirement, which is uh, when an offense is committed or likely to be committed, etc. And there are provisions um, which I told you about the reasonable restrictions reasonable restrictions is for avoidance of crime, etc. Law enforcement has got certain uh, powers. So within those powers, if there is a proper documentation, there is no issue. The uh, power has to be exercised through a proper process and properly documented. Okay. And that is one of the requirements of government or law enforcement as a stakeholder. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah. Uh, Nitya is asking, what is the difference between uh, data fiduciary and data processor? Data fiduciary is like the data controller of GDPR. That is the person who has the control over the means of uh, processing. Uh, how the data, personal data is being processed. Data processor is the contractual processor who processes it only with, from the point of view of the contract. His, uh, I mean, uh, Mm, obligations are limited to the contractual obligation with the data fiduciary. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, sir. Uh, we go ahead now. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You, you oh. can. Continue. Okay. 
Yes. We'll come back to some questions. Yes, yes. I hope some time will be left. Okay, yeah. let me see. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, the, now, yeah. Coming to the applicability, as I already told, uh, application applicability of this act is for personal data collected, disclosed, shared, or otherwise processed in India. And it includes processing by government or individual or any other association of persons, including HUF, etc. Okay. Entities outside India, if they process uh, data in India, or the data of Indian citizens for profiling purpose, they are also covered. These are things similar uh, to what GDPR uh, uh, provides. Processing includes collection, aggregation, and also disaggregation. That is, de-identification, etc. is also part of the processing. Profiling includes prediction, creating an opinion about the data subject or the data principle based on whatever information is observed. So this relationship I explained, data principle and the data fiduciary, the use of the word data fiduciary casts a duty on the data fiduciary to protect the privacy of the data principle. Remember, this is a duty to protect the privacy of the individual, not duty to just protect the data of the data uh, given to him. Protecting the data given to me is a smaller responsibility than protecting the privacy of the person who has given some data to me. That is what makes this law, PDPA, far superior to GDPR in terms of privacy protection. You may argue that why I as an IT person is made responsible for that human rights protection, but that is the origin of the data protection law. That's why I spent time to explain that Personal Data Protection Act basic objective is to protect privacy, not principally to protect only data. Okay, so that is also reiterated by calling the data controller of, in GDPR here as a data fiduciary. In fact, this concept is likely to become the norm for the globe. Already in US, there is a federal law which is being presented there for privacy law for passage. In that, they have used the same principle and want to give this kind of a fiduciary responsibility to the data controller. Now, by giving this, what happens is consent assumes lesser criticality than the fiduciary responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So, in India, where language is an issue, uh, the education of the data subject is an issue, just providing a particular uh, privacy statement on a mobile application and getting a click will not help the data fiduciary to escape his responsibilities. So that is one of the innovations of this particular uh, act. As far as the sensitive personal data is concerned, currently section 43A of Information Technology Act had a definition. Now some expansion has been made. There is financial health data, official identifier, sex life, sex orientation, etc., has been added. And uh, password, which was a sensitive information under ITA 2000, is not there in this particular list. Then caste and tribe, which was not there in Information Technology Act, is included. Religious or political affiliation is also included as sensitive personal data. Okay, so there is some difference uh, between the definition of sensitive personal data, as we understand today, and this. Okay. Data fiduciaries, I told you, we have the significant data fiduciaries who are notified. Guardian data fiduciaries is a term used for such data fiduciaries who process the data of minors in a significant manner. If it's a occasional uh, processing, they may not be defined, but otherwise they will be called guardian data fiduciaries. Consent manager is a special kind of data fiduciary who is if you want to find a very, I mean, um, understandable relationship in Copyright Act, we have got uh, this uh, copyright uh, uh, managers, uh, copyright societies, which actually try to protect the copyright owner uh, and help him in uh, all the uh, issues regarding pursuing the copyright infringement, etc. Similarly, here, there will be a consent manager who is obviously a data fiduciary who can, on behalf of the data principal, deal with the data fiduciaries, the normal data fiduciaries, 
in managing the consent of the data principal so that he can question the data fiduciary why are you asking consent for this particular permission this particular permission how are you going to use it in your processing if you don't want to use it why are you adding this these sort of questions which only an informed person can ask and the data principal cannot ask is now delegated optionally to this consent manager therefore this consent manager business is itself a beautiful business which certain people can take up it is like your digi locker kind of business okay the other category is the social media intermediary the government retains under pdpa recommend i mean uh, right to declare certain organizations as social media intermediaries and prescribe them with the norms of pers personal data protection similar to significant data fiduciaries one of the important provisions of pdpa is that these social media intermediaries examples are your twitters and facebook they are required to provide an option to the data principal to get the himself that is data principal verified that is today twitter says i will give you a verified tick but it is at their discretion now subject to the provision of whatever identity documents the dpa may fix if yes if i provide that document i can mandate the social media intermediary to put a verified tick in front of my name the idea is that to curb the fake news menace in the social media the government is trying to create a set of people who will voluntarily submit their identity to the social media entity and want them to be identified so over a period of time if more and more people get themselves identified then probably persons who are not identified will be considered as less reliable when they pass out some messages in their social media that is the kind of uh, understanding which is there in this uh, qualification okay now coming to the basic obligations of a data fiduciary the normal principles of data protection which was there in the eu law for a long time continues here also the data has to be processed lawfully purpose oriented collection only is permitted then once collected it has to be only for the particular purpose not for another purpose then collection should be only minimized to the extent required for that particular purpose a proper notice has to be given to the person uh, before collection of the information and this notice will have to have all the details as you are aware like in gdpr um, then the quality of data that is the correctness of the data has to be maintained over a period of time uh, retention has to be restricted only as long as it is required and the person who collects who is the data fiduciary should be accountable and of course consent is a necessity these are all the basic Uh, data processing principles which are there in this particular act these are similar to what we are otherwise aware so i will uh, go to the next uh, uh, aspect which is consent for children in the case of children one of the issues is you have to verify the age and obtain parental consent and companies or organizations which Uh, process a substantial part of their information processing in uh, the category of uh, children pro uh, data like your byjus and other things and they will have to register themselves as guardian data fiduciaries and these guardian data fiduciaries may be actually barred from profiling tracking etc and uh, parental consent is essential for the most of the guardian data fiduciaries except those activities which are something like counseling for child abuse so if some organization is providing counseling for children then in such cases parental consent is not required because maybe the abuse is from the parent or the guardian himself so there is a requirement of uh, parental consent for children the problem here is in a particular instance whether you are processing the personal data of a minor or an adult will only be known when you collect the age 
So verification of age, in most cases, uh, will be a necessity. Uh, particularly if a service is oriented to children, then uh, age verification becomes mandatory. In any other case, if you come across any information, for example, in your profiling, you come to know that a particular person is a minor and you have collected it just like any other data, then due diligence requires you to immediately stop and take a break and say that my profiling, my uh, AI algorithm says this person is a minor and therefore I, I should have taken the consent of the parent. So companies which process the data intelligently and come to know that a person is a minor should have appropriate controls to immediately provide for necessary uh, parental consents. Okay. There are a few instances in which the law says consent is not necessary. Basically, this is exemption from consent, not exemption from all the aspects of the law. Here, the performance of any functions of the state, which is authorized by law, then if the government wants to process like issuing of licenses, certificates, something of that nature, then consent is not uh, required. Then if a parliament makes any specific law, then it is permitted. Then if it is a judgment of the court tribunal, then also it is uh, permitted. Then in cases of medical emergencies, disaster, employment situations, also consent is not required. But in the case of employment situations, only for non-sensitive data processing can be done without consent. Basically, this is to accommodate pre-recruitment uh, processing or post, uh, you can say, discharge uh, processing. In between when a person is an employee, you can process sensitive data also based on a particular contract. Other than this, some other reasonable purposes have been recognized for which, in which consent is not required, but other aspects of uh, data being protected, etc., will be required. They are, one is for prevention of fraud, for information security, any monitoring done, whistleblowing, mergers and acquisitions, credit scoring, debt recovery. These are all some of the situations in which consent is not necessary. The idea here is the government has thought through the provisions of PDPA and has ensured that in certain instances, we cannot overreach the privacy protection to the extent that it will hinder the progress of industry and therefore provided for some exemptions. This is what sometimes the privacy activists are unhappy and they say that it is not as strong as it should have been. Okay, now as far as the rights are concerned, the first right is a data principal can ask a company, are you, uh, please confirm whether you are processing my data and he can also ask for access of what is being processed. He can ask for corrections and erasure if the purpose is over. There is this data portability, which is requesting the data fiduciary to return the data either to the data principal or to the uh, somebody else. There is right to, for, to be forgotten, but Indian right to be forgotten is not absolute like in the case of GDPR. Here, right to be forgotten can be exercised only with the permission of the adjudicator. So if the data fiduciary has any reasons to believe that the data cannot be permanently erased, he can always refuse to erase and then take it to the adjudicator. If the adjudicator permits, then only the right to be forgotten will be um, permitted. So this is one, uh, you can say, check which has been given on uh, deletion of data particularly because India has a lot of data which is used, which is required for law enforcement purposes, terrorism prevention, etc. So right to be forgotten cannot be universally accepted. Okay. Then such cases, it has to be in right, request has to be in writing, a fee may be charged, time of response is not presently specified, it will be specified later. And 
in case the data fiduciary feels that by acceding to the request of one data fiduciary, somebody else's uh, interests are harmed, he can refuse it, citing that particular reason. These are the areas where a harm audit is required. I told you about a harm audit. So when a right is being exercised by the data principal and there are reasons for the fiduciary to refuse it, prima facie, then he has to conduct a harm audit and then keep a documentation which uh, provides an opportunity for him to uh, politely refuse the uh, request. Otherwise, compliance, privacy by design, policy has to be approved. Significant data should be registered. The DPO should be appointed mandatorily by a significant data fiduciary. DPIA to be conducted and approved. Annual data to be conducted. Cross-border transfer restricted only for the uh, significant uh, sensitive personal data, reporting of data breaches, all these are part of the compliance. What is special about PDPA is annual data audit, when it is conducted, the auditor has to assign a value called the data trust score to the evaluation. In a way, like credit score, the auditor has to provide a DTS score. Now, in, uh, this measurability of the audit is one of the innovations which this act has uh, brought in. And I feel that is one of the strong points of this act also. Now, as far as the DPO is concerned, he has got multiple responsibilities, provide information and advice to the data fiduciary, monitor the processing, provide advice about DPIA, review the privacy by design policy. All these are internal functions. Additionally, the DPO is answerable to the Data Protection Authority. He has to assist the Data Protection Authority, who, which is an external regulatory authority. And whenever his assistance is called for, most probably the assistance is for a decision which goes against the company. Therefore, the DPA is in a very difficult situation like the statutory auditor sometimes will be confronted with finding of some irregularities. They do not know what to do with reporting of that. Company secretaries also are under similar dilemma. The same kind of dilemma will be there for DPA. The last point is that the DPO is also the single point of contact for the data principles, which means that this person should have the technical knowledge, the ability to assist the DPA, ability to deal with the grievances of the uh, individuals. So DPO actually need a lot of soft skills to manage uh, his uh, role. As regards the penalties, it says that for certain penalties, it will be uh, for contraventions, the penalty will be up to a maximum of five crores or 2% of the global turnover, whichever is higher. In certain cases, it is 15 crores and 4% of the global turnover. This 2%, 4% is similar to what GDPR has stated, except that the amount has been uh, reduced to rupee tons, which is much smaller than in the case of GDPR. There are other penalties for violating directions per day delay or something like that. These are all the civil penalties. And this will be also applicable to government agencies. But in the case of government agencies, there is no turnover limit. Maximum is five crores. And these penalties are normally subject to the adjudication. And adjudication can be appealed in an appellate tribunal. Appellate tribunal's decisions can be questioned in the Supreme Court. So that is the system which is there. In fact, the Data Protection Authority has to refer to the adjudicator for the quantification of the penalties. As far as criminal offenses are concerned, there is only one offense which has been mentioned, which is re-identification of a de-identified data. See, we know that when we say personal data is subject to this particular law, anonymized data is completely out of this law. De-identified data where certain aspects of identifiability of a personal data has been removed is in between the identifiable personal data and the anonymized data because this can be re-identified if you have the mapping information with you. But re-identification done for a malicious purpose qualifies for three years uh, punishment. But uh, this is cognizable only if the Data Protection Authority files a complaint. 
police cannot uh, suo moto take action on this nor even a public member of the public can make a complaint uh, under pdpa for any reidentification this offense is cognizable only if the data protection authority files a complaint with the police rest of the data breaches if there is any uh, criminal punishment it has to come under the information technology act one of the compliance requirements under pdpa is that the organization should provide a proper grievance redressal mechanism so this is something which is a mandatory uh, provision as far as the transfer of data outside india is concerned like in gdpr there are standard contractual clauses consent based uh, transfer is possible or uh, adequacy of another country is permitted uh, if specific authority, uh, authority approval is given all these are permitted and the restriction on transfer of data outside india applies only for this sensitive personal information not for personal information in the 2018 version there was a provision that a, a serving copy has to be maintained in india that has been removed uh, in the present version only for sensitive personal information a copy may have to be kept in india there is something called critical information which we do not know what will be the critical information for that government may impose little more uh, restrictions this is also one of the aspects on which uh, some people uh, frequently uh, criticize saying that uh, if data is taken uh, is not allowed to be taken out of india then there will be difficulty for the industry <clears throat> so that is uh, the general essence of uh, the particular uh, act now a few slides on the audit mechanism i have already told you this is an audit of the harm which may be conduct committed to a data principal so a auditor will have to actually think of a particular risk if this risk manifests what harm can happen to a b c d e that is the basic focus of this audit it should be carried through in risk assessment privacy by design policy dpia report and all measurements of uh, compliances okay now there are a few sections uh, which you can go through separately just to give you the uh, uh, rough view of that dpia that is data protection impact assessment is required whenever large scale profiling is there and such dpia should contain the detailed description assessment of the potential harm and measures which the government uh, with the particular organization has taken for mitigating the risk with this dpia report has to be sent to the data protection authority and his approval has to be taken it is possible that the dpa may refuse approval in which case the particular process will have to be dropped okay now the compliance audit which is the normal uh, data audit um, uh, which uh, has to look at the compliance requirement based on whatever the act says includes a term which is called the data trust score okay and uh, also if you look at this uh, data auditor will evaluate the compliance about clarity and effectiveness of notices measures adopted for security transparency safeguards adopted personal data breach all that is uh, uh, easily understood but uh, for the purpose of conducting this data audits the dpa is likely to institute a system of registering the persons as data auditors this is the area where professional opportunities are being created and uh, there the person who like you are in the patent law you have got a patent examiner being approved by the data protection authority by the patent authority similarly here we expect that the data protection authority may not only put in the necessary norms but also may have its own examination kind of a system to approve the data auditors now um coming to this data trust score the data trust score the pdpa says that uh, the data auditor must assign a rating in the form of a data trust score and for 
assigning a rating, there are some guidelines which are there, but perhaps this will have to be um, uh, further refined by the Data Protection Authority when it comes out with the detailed uh, notifications. I have tried to put in some thought on how this DTS uh, evaluation can be done. We may have to actually uh, develop a framework which tries to make an assessment of managerial organizational business practices with the data protection obligations, how they are being uh, done by the particular organization, etc. And for all these things, it is not enough if we have a subjective assessment of the level of compliance an organization has mentioned, you have to reduce it to some number. And that number should end up with proper weightages as one single number. And this data trust score will have to be disclosed in the notices for uh, collection of personal data. And I feel that it may become necessary to be part of the annual reports okay so otherwise all aspects of the compliance will have to be taken into account i have tried to look at a methodology for this this is just for an indication others auditors can develop their own systems i have tried to take five elements commitment of the organization knowledge level of the organization controls they have implemented whether there is a review mechanism like internal audits and whether there is a grievance redressal system, all these five elements I am trying to evaluate on a scale of one to 100 and then assign specific points and then use a weightage mechanism to reduce these five different scores into a single weighted uh, uh, score. People who are more interested in this may please go through my website for uh, detailed uh, this thing. So, I will uh, not go into that in detail right now. The last section, I would also like to draw your attention to the fact that if we want to evaluate the compliance requirements, the current frameworks for personal data uh, protection may or may not be adequate in my view. Therefore, we need to have a new framework and uh, I have tried to work on something, but again, this is a, a suggestion. I have called it as Personal Data Protection Standard of India, which is a suggested framework, a step beyond PS 10,012 and uh, ISO 27701. And um, again, I don't want to go into the details of this, but I just want to tell you that the implementation framework for this kind of a model has one important aspect which is classification of personal data. Second, allocation of responsibilities of data protection on a distributed model within the organization. Then of course, technical controls, policies and building a culture. Okay, let us uh, leave this again to a uh, discussion on a later day. In fact, under FDPPI, we are developing a certification program which tries to address all these five modules of requirement, awareness of law, of Indian law, global law, then technology, auditing, um, so that uh, a person who is called a data protection professional has to be an expert in multiple uh, kind of uh, skills. So this, I would like to bring it to an end here uh, and take questions. Um, I'm sure there will be a lot of questions and uh, uh, for further reading, if you want, you can look at this book. And for those of you who want to be certified uh, under the FTPPI program, you look at the possibility of taking the next certification program, which will be starting in uh, on April uh, 4th. Please look at the FTPPI website for more details. Okay, Satish, um, now another 20 minutes for questions. Yes, yes. <laughs> but uh, there are a lot of questions. Uh, now, we, of course, it, it, it's going very well. In fact, uh, because the participants' atten attention itself uh, says that uh, it's going very well. There are 300 plus participants currently still live. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, that's great. And there are questions are overwhelming. Uh, I know we cannot cover everything. Of okay. course, 
Most of the initial questions would have been covered in your following slides. There are some questions on uh, penalties, I think, definitely covered. And uh, I know there are too many questions, but I'll definitely... Uh, Conceptual questions, if there are any. Yeah, correct. correct. So, there are, definitely, there are a lot of good comments, a lot of good... Uh, so, so, there are some uh, repeated questions which uh, I can just... Uh, so, can can we have some examples on re-identification re of de-identified data? I think this is coming multiple times. So I think De-identification means removal of certain parameters of identity. For example, a data set, a personal data set, is not a single data. See, name is one element. Along with that, there has to be an email address, so there may be some address, uh, phone number, etc. So, we have got a uh, Excel sheet with uh, multiple columns. Maybe there will be a PAN number, there will be an author number, etc. Now, and uh, add to that, let us say, a health data or something like that. Okay, so this is the health data of Mr. So and so, so and so, like that. Now, de identification, what we need to do is that all elements which can be used to identify the individual should be removed. And only the data which is raw data of an individual, but I don't know who is that individual, that alone has to be segregated, which means that some of the columns of this data set will have to be identified as material which is likely to be used for identification. And if you take it out and map it differently with a proxy ID, then that is called de-identified data. Now, once a de-identified data is there, it can be shared for certain limited purposes. Anonymous data can be shared easily uh, without any restrictions. De-identified data will be shared under a controlled environment. But the receiver of that de-identified information may, by collecting information from some other source, try to identify the particular person uh, through his own AI algorithm or something, that will be re-identification and that if it results in the particular data set getting identified to an individual, then that is something which the law does not want to happen without the consent. Okay, so this concept of de-identification and re-identification is also there in HIPAA and uh, which of the elements become identifiable parameters in a data set will have to be determined on a case-to-case -case basis. That is why classification of data as personal data and within the multiple parameters of the personal data, classifying some parameters as identity parameters, they become critical to the data protection under the law. If you remove the email address, but I can find out that email address from somewhere else, then the de identification may not be perfect. Okay, I, uh, parameters like Aadhaar or PAN card are individually identity parameters. So even without the name, if Aadhaar number is there, it is fully identifiable. So it has to be removed. So these are the things which one has to decide in de-identification and re-identification. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so few people just want to uh, have a word with you. I'm just unmuting them. Uh, Vikram, uh, Mr. Vikram, I'm just, uh, I'll be unmuting you and you can just uh, talk to Mr. Navi. Vikram, I think Vikram Raghuvir, correct? Uh, Vikram Raghuvir. So Vikram, you can talk, uh, you can speak now because you're unmuted. Yeah, Vikram. Hello, Vikram, can you speak? Yeah, can you hear me now, Navi, sir? Yeah, 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 I can hear you. Yeah. Sir, thank you for a lovely presentation, sir. Thank you. Uh, sir, I have just a couple of questions. My first question is, you're talking about external auditors as well as internal auditors. What specific qualifications they should have? Should they have a computer science degree? Should they have a law degree? Say, internal auditor, I told you, data protection officer. He must have a knowledge of privacy law, uh, which is essential, otherwise you don't know what to do. Then knowledge of technology, knowledge of what I call as data auditing. Okay, that is estimating the harm which may be caused 
if a data is processed in a particular manner. So these are the general descriptions. Uh, within this, he should have the skill sets to make an assessment and also document it in a proper uh, report uh, form. As far as the external auditors are concerned, and maybe this is also applicable to DPOs, the Data Protection Authority may provide more detailed requirements. Basically, they will also say that you should have the knowledge of the law, knowledge of technology, something like that. Beyond that, they cannot specify in greater detail. So generally, the uh, privacy law knowledge should be there, technology should be there, skills of auditing should be there. And to actually prepare the people for this only, we have the certified data protection uh, professional course which we are running, in which different modules are there for these different kinds of uh, uh, skill sets. Okay. So beyond this, you have to wait for the DPA to come up with their own these things. Uh, and then only you will know exactly what is the requirement. I am envisaging that, as I told you, in the case of the patent uh, examiner's examination, DPA may conduct its own examination and provide the certification to the external data auditors. That is, just because you are a CA, yeah. you will not be automatically becoming a data auditor, approved data auditor. <laughs> I think that is sufficient. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Girish, Girish, you can go ahead and talk. Girish, you are unmuted. Girish, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello, yeah, yeah, yeah. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, hi, now, sir. I have a few questions. Yeah. The first one is uh, privacy by design, mm. the policy which you mm. explained. Mm. With respect to PDPA, mm. have to be uh, uh, that has to be uh, authorized by the DPA for yeah. all the size of companies or only for the for high risk data fiduciaries. Sorry, for those who are classified as significant data fiduciaries. Significant data fiduciaries. Okay, yeah, I got and you. That classification may depend upon the volume of data. This and uh, type, uh, type of the data. Type of data which is being. Processed. Correct, understood. Yeah, because I have a fair understanding of GDPR, so I'm asking, I'm comparing with that. Yeah, yeah. And the consent manager, what you said, the consent manager, does yeah. he has to uh, have an, any interest with the business? Can can he be an internal person or he has to be an external? No, person? I think what is envisaged is as an intermediary between the data principal and the data fiduciary. So. It will be better if you use a third party. Third party, external person. Yes. So if I'm a company, if I'm uh, recommending to have someone to have a consent manager, he has to be a third party person. Some yes. company who is providing services, such yes. services. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Is there a provision in the uh, PDPA to acknowledge to the data principal that the data protection right request, that is DSR, whatever in GDPR, that the uh, rights request have been received and under process through the yes. data adjudicator? It, it will be there, it will be there, but exactly okay. what is the time within which you time have to specify and other things, you have to wait. Is not, it's not specified still, but there is a way to acknowledge, correct? Because yeah, 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 yeah. correct. Uh, and one more, the last question is, now we have the DPA. So the DPAs are at the national level. So we do have the state law. Every state like Karnataka, Tamil Nadu have their own state law, Mumbai, whatever, Maharashtra. So do we have a DPAs at the state level as well? There is one DPA. And even uh -huh. the sectoral regulators will have to be coordinated by this DPA. But DPA may set up regional offices wherever it, it requires. Okay. okay. So that is a centrally controlled by national level. National DPA is authority. So that's why it's authority. very powerful. It's like CDS. You have heard of this uh, chief defense, this thing, no? Army, uh -huh. Army, Navy, and this, there is one super uh, defense, uh, this thing now, CDS. Same way, Correct. Uh, for same and others. Um, everybody, as far as the data protection, is, data protection is concerned, DPA may have a supervisory uh, responsibility. So for DPA, it's not one single person. It's a board mm -hmm. of at least seven persons, Correct. ten persons, and six other persons. Uh, 
So they will have to actually coordinate with uh, the sectoral regulators and state governments and then ensure. Perfect. Okay, so it will be enforced through the regulators and uh, government yeah. uh, authorities, supervisory authorities. Yeah. Yeah. Correct, correct. I understood. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. So there are plenty of questions now, uh, but uh, I'm just pay, I'll pick I up. I have take out. Yeah, yeah. So I'll just, uh, yeah, we have time and we can just pick up few. <clears throat> I'm just also seeing parallelly because the few questions in, uh, I think, yeah, one Mr. Naik want to talk to you. So let me unmute him. So, um, yeah, you can uh, speak, um, Mr. Naik. Meet Naik. Yeah, Naik, go ahead. You're unmuted. So even after Hello? this... Yeah, 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 go ahead. Okay, yeah, good, good evening, sir. Uh, so it was a great session, I must say. So the thing is, uh, I am quite aware about the GDPR laws and regulation. So the thing is, uh, India is not uh, that good in the protection of the data itself. Uh, uh, is India ready for uh, uh, PDPA like uh, uh, See, you, the you laws and regulation? To implement it. So you have to be ready. Government is showing its intention. Yeah. All of us are responsible yeah. for implementation now. So Sorry. that responsibility is on us. Now the DPOs in each organization have to equip themselves and uh, we have to stand up and uh, tomorrow if adequacy discussion comes, the GDPR authorities have to consider that Indian uh, protection is better than their, this thing. So that responsibility is with us. So I don't want to debate on whether we are ready. We have to get ready. Yeah, understood. Okay. Yeah. But one thing okay. about GDPR, all those people who are familiar with GDPR should to some extent understand that there are certain differences between PDPA and GDPR. So in certain cases, you may have to unlearn what you have learned with GDPR. Don't blindly apply a WP note or something like that in India. It may not be later on accepted by the authorities. So um, use that as a guideline definitely, but look at Indian law as something different. Um, and uh, try to adopt your understanding of GDPR to understanding of PDPA. That is my suggestion. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So there's one, one uh, question about uh, if the company is handling EU and Indian citizens' data, then they need to be compliant with PDP and GDPR as well. Uh, the question is, in such scenario, can there be any conflicts between the two? That is PDP and GDPR. There are, there are two things here. One is, there are going to be more than 100 countries which are going to have uh, privacy laws, each applicable to their citizens. So if an Indian organization is handling the uh, data, personal data of different companies, they will have to, through a classification, data classification system, create silos in which separate legal uh, provisions can be applied to different silos, that is one. Second, Indian law provides this exemption by notification if a company in India is handling GDPR information, essentially what we are talking of is the personal data of EU citizens or profiling of EU related operations. You create a separate division for that, create an arm's length relationship between other activities and then go to the DPA and say that please exempt me this division from the operations of PDPA. There is a provision in PDPA for that permission. So either you use that provision of creating something like your ODCs separately for different country processing or through a data classification system. If you look at my PDPSI uh, uh, structure, I have created a classification of personal data in which one of the parameters or tags is which is the applicable law. Is PDPA applicable, whether Singapore law is applicable, whether UCCPA is applicable, whether GDPR is applicable. There will be very few chances of overlapping. There will be only concurrent application for different uh, sets because I don't think there will be dual citizenship kind of a thing. If a dual citizenship comes, then perhaps 
two these things are there. See, GDPR says for monitoring activities of EU transactions, GDPR is applicable. And yeah, BDPS says for monitoring the transactions in the Indian continent, this PDPA is applicable. Basically, the land where the transaction arises, that becomes more crucial uh, for the application. And the cause of action lies with the respective citizens in the respective countries. If we remember that, most of these controversies, uh, I mean, overlappings can be addressed. But within an organization, if you are handling multiple countries' things, you must have a proper system of classification. And from time to time, you may have to resolve these kind of doubts. Uh, there cannot be a general law for that. Thanks, uh, th thanks, now, sir. Uh, Sashidhar, you can uh, you can talk. You can speak now. Yeah, uh, Navi, Namaskara. Yeah, uh, yeah. I have uh, two suggestions, please. Yeah. Uh, one is on the. Uh, I think this has been an excellent session. Uh, I would feel that the chapter members will be benefited if we FDPPI and Isaka Bangalore chapter have a one day workshop on PDPA. That's after one. Corona, after this Corona, we yes, can exactly. <laughs> okay. the second one is I think uh, Isaka Bangalore chapter and FDPPI yeah. must uh, write a white paper on PDPA, including audit frameworks and the DTS scoring system okay. that uh, you uh, shared. Because yeah. I think uh, there'll be a lot of practitioners uh, who will be benefiting from, especially Isaka members and non members also who will benefit from this. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Okay. In fact, FDPPA wants to create codes and practices for different requirements. And when the DPA comes into operation, I want to be ready with at least eight or ten codes and practices to be presented to them. This is the codes and practice you can follow for registration of significant data fiduciaries. This is for guardian fiduciaries. This is for this. This is for that. That is my ambition. Um, I hope we will be able to work together in that. Thanks, Sashid, but uh, yeah, it was a good session. And uh, yeah, uh, so I'm very sorry to, uh, for all of you. In fact, there are, there are overwhelming questions. It is, it's really difficult to uh, cover all of them, but I'm sure all of you should uh, uh, visit uh, navi.org. I think Navi, he in fact puts a lot of this uh, as part of the Q&A and uh, he has in fact answered to most of the questions what are there here. But uh, but still, if someone still wants to, I think there are a few more who just want to uh, speak. Uh, maybe um, now, is it, can I? Can we take one or two? Uh, I have no problem. Even if you extend by another ten minutes, I don't have any problem. Excellent, excellent. So maybe I'll unmute uh, Rena Jane. I think you know, she wants to talk to you. So just uh, I, I'm just that's much easy to uh, Rena Jane. Uh, you you can speak. Anyone else also uh, want to talk to talk? I think you can just uh, put it in chat window. It's much easy. Yeah. You can speak now. You're unmuted. Hello. Looks like. Uh, okay, Alka Singh, you can talk. You can speak. Alka Singh. Looks like uh, there's some difficulty. Yeah. See you. <clears throat> Anybody else? Uh, uh, Al no, Alka, you're not. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, first of all, Hello. thank you, thank you uh, Navi sir and the panelists for uh, uh, for the session today. It has been very informative and it is quite detailed for all of us. And uh, one question that I have, uh, which I have been facing uh, difficulty in Im implementing on ground is that how can we uh, implement privacy by design uh, uh, a privacy by design for the existing systems. See, um, most of these kind of exercises, it is difficult to reduce it to a template. I never believe in 
uh, writing a template for any of these activities because it has to be customized. Now, one of the issues which you will come across uh, is what to do with the legacy data. In GDPR also, you came across that uh, difficulty as of the 25th um, uh, May 2018. If you already had GDPR data, you are supposed to um, uh, kill that data. Uh, Indian uh, provision also may come to that, that you have to take a fresh consent and taking fresh consent means that uh, if you don't get that consent, you have to remove that data. So the first thing you have to do is to discover the personal data in your system, which is coming under the PDPA. And there this classification has to be made as whether that personal data is uh, Indian citizens data or uh, some other data. And only, I am talking of today, only the Indian citizens data which comes under PDPA, you should be able to segregate that by either logical segregation or whatever you want and take it out separately. And then impose this uh, consent and other requirements for that particular set of data. So this has to be customized based on the existence of a certain kind of personal data in your organization. And wherever possible, you have to try to get a consent before, uh, as soon as the law becomes effective. And you have to also have a policy of what to do if you don't get the consent. Okay. okay. How many times you can remind? And if you remind too many times, then that becomes an harassment. So you must de develop what is called a legitimate interest policy. Certain cases you may be able to make use of the data under legitimate interest policy or available con I mean, exemptions. If it can be done, it is fine. So you have to work out all these things customized to your requirement. Okay, so I will not go for any template kind of a thing that if you have this, all these checklists, you can uh, do it. It is difficult to uh, come to such a conclusion. Okay. okay. Okay, and I have one more question. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I've been very, I'm not sure if it is relevant, but I've been very curious about how are these penalties calculated? Because what we see in these laws is just the number or the percentages. So if at high level, if you can just tell us how you is- You have some that? indication in the case of GDPR. Okay. Uh, but actually there is, some whims and fancies are involved. Different supervisory authorities have been uh, providing different uh, these things. Um, for example, uh, so not appointing a DPO. I think one uh, one supervisory authority has put two hundred thousand US dollars or something like that. Not conducting a DPIA. That school in Switzerland, which was having this uh, face recognition, uh, mm -hmm. some hundred hundred thousand. Now, where is the logic for that? Uh, I don't know. Uh, it all depends on the uh, adjudicator in India. DPA is not going to decide on the quantum of penalty. DPA will identify the uh, violation, then refer it to the adjudicator. Adjudicator may give you an opportunity to present your views. And after taking your views, basically the general rule is, if you are aware that a contravention was there, and you did not take adequate precautions to mitigate it, you are a little lethargic kind of a thing, then the uh, penalty will be higher. If you have tried to mitigate the risk, at least after coming to know there was a breach or something like that, perhaps the um, penalty may be less. If you look at some of the HIPAA awards, that is penalty awards, you will get some good logic which has been mentioned there. And uh, in GDPR, still, I think it has to stabilize. There have been instances of 300 million and other uh, things. Um, uh, so in India, this has to develop. But this 4%, 2% is the upper limit. You have to have adequate cyber insurance cover and hope that you will be able to cover your uh, losses within what is affordable. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for the detailed explanation. And uh, just one point I'll add here uh, in, in the uh, face of Corona, all of you just stay safe, stay indoors. As you already yeah. guys know. Yeah. Thank and you so much. You have to worry about the security for work from home. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. We are not ready. You know, many of the companies were not ready. Uh, mm -hmm. If they had some system in place, they could have extended it to all the employees. 
Mm -hmm. uh, if they had BY body, perhaps they could have easily implemented it. For other companies, so they, it is a challenge. Absolutely. Yeah. But now we, many companies are struggling to say, like my company, FinTech and all, mm -hmm. open up a work from home uh, completely. So, Difficult. Difficult. security okay. challenges. But de definitely there will be technology solutions. Only thing is, yes, we yes. have not implemented it so far because of but, the cost and other things. Yeah. Now, suddenly the requirement has come to our. Uh, yeah. And the other worries, uh, in fact, I was very doubt, doubtful whether how this Zoom will work today because of so much. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Bandwidth. Everyone jumping into Zoom and uh, I'm, I'm sure many of you know Teams was down for some time. Uh, 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 uh. But I'm happy this, the session went very well. Uh, in fact, uh, I know there are plenty of questions, but I think uh, for the benefit of time, so we will end up here. I think uh, now, sir, in fact, a big thank you. In fact, uh, I don't know if you have, want want to ha have any closing comments because still all the participants are uh, live. Uh, my, fact, closing, my closing comments is please make use of the opportunity to go through the certification program which FDPPA is offering. Be one of the first professionals. The second batch we are now starting. Okay, first batch is already there. Before uh, the act comes into existence, we want 100, 200 professionals with some kind of a uh, basic understanding so that we can all go to the DPA and say, please uh, make these people eligible for data audit uh, requirements. Because if you leave it to the DPA, they will take a lot more time to define the terms. And that terms may be logical or not logical also. We never know. Okay, so uh, that is the only last comment I would like to make. In fact, um, there could be, in fact, most of these organizations have provided a lot of uh, reduction in our uh, uh, certification uh, examination fee. Uh, so you can consider, your members should be able to consider that and be prepared for data audit uh, on a later day. <clears throat> and also to be DPOs. DPOs will be a big opportunity for many of the professionals. I don't know the profile of all the people who came today, whether they are all uh, ISACA kind of uh, people or uh, IS and uh, uh, legal counsels were also there. So. Yeah. They, it will be helpful if they look at acquiring this kind of uh, certification, which for the first time it's being given. Whatever I am going to do in our FDPPA, this will be far better than any CIPP and other things. Let me give you the assurance. But we are still building. Uh, these five modules we are building. When these entire five modules are completed, the knowledge level of this particular certified person should be far higher than any of the CIPP programs. And it will be all relevant to India. That is the focus will be India. So take Absolutely. advantage of that. <clears throat> so thank you very much. And uh, see, I think uh, many people are asking. So this 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 recording will be available in the Isaka Bangalore YouTube channel. Uh, you okay. can really, uh, view it late uh, at a later state. So this is getting recorded and, and it will be available. And uh, and requesting all of you. So now you said maybe any email ID you can give, or I don't know if participants can reach to you. So my email ID is there in navi.org. In fact, uh, my, <laughs> including my yeah. mobile number. I have kept it in the public domain only. So okay. navi, navi9 at gmail.com or navi at navi.org, any of that will be fine. Excellent. Excellent. Even Many people are asking about how to reach you. So I think navi.org, I request all of you to visit that. And uh, yeah. I, uh, yeah, I think, and also request you, maybe recommend you to all uh, look at this book. So. So with that, I think we should uh, end up this. Otherwise, it's already 7:45. Uh, a big thank you, uh, Navi sir. In fact, uh, I anyway come and meet you. And uh, thank you for all the 200 and plus people, 300 people. Now it are 200 people are still there. Fine. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thanks for the enthusiasm. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. And uh, uh, stay safe, uh, stay healthy. And I think tomorrow uh, it's a it's a bandh, janta bandh. In fact, uh, or morning 7 to night 9 p.m. So let's all stay at home and stay safe and stay healthy and stay secure. So with that, uh, on behalf of uh, the whole Isaka Bangalore chapter, uh, Navi sir, I want to put a big thank you note. And of course, okay, I okay, okay. Thank you personally. Thank you. And uh, I really appreciate your time, efforts, and uh, the enthusiasm in fact in explaining all of the queries. Uh, in fact, thank you very much once again. Thank you all participants for in fact staying uh, so long. And with that note, uh, so thank you and a good day to all of you. Stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Take care. Bye.